mention that because the brain homework is going to be due on, is it, let me double check it. I've got this calendar right here. It is Saturday, March 27th, and we won't actually, 22nd? No, March 27th. I'm, I'm looking at it right now. Saturday, March 27th. My, my. <laughs> oh, you're, oh, okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> are you okay, Yashika? You all right? <laughs> yeah, just teasing. Uh, so Saturday 27th, but we won't really finish the chapter on the brain until Friday the, the uh, 26th, a week from today. So... Uh, some of you, I know, I've seen it. Some of you like to get those homeworks done super early. But if you would like to wait and make sure that we get all of this stuff covered before you do that, uh, you might want to set aside a time on Saturday to get that homework done because we'll have all of brain done. So the brain consists of four major regions. You can see them listed on page 153. I've got them listed here on this screen too. The cerebrum. And the cerebrum is just the biggest part of the brain that most people recognize when you see a picture of the brain you're like that's the brain and in fact it comes from a word in latin that means brain so it's it's not actually that fancy of a word and it wouldn't be that fancy if you were a roman that spoke latin you'd be like yeah that's not even a special name at all that's the word for the brain uh and then just below it i'll skip a little bit just below it, pictured in blue right here, is this thing that means the little brain, the cerebellum, the cerebrum and the cerebellum. So these are the two parts that are mo most identifiable. What's a little tricky is embedded deep within, really both of them, but mostly deep within the cerebrum, is this area that in your textbook they've kind of pulled it out by sort of removing all of this big piece of cauliflower on top called your cerebrum. And when you remove that, you end up with this network deep down inside called the diencephalon, right up in here, this little kind of, looks like a little almond or something like that. And then the rest of it, all the way down here, you can see the bracket right there that I sort of drew over, is called the brainstem. And it consists of uh, three subdivisions called the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. Make sure right from the start that you memorize those in order from su superior to inferior because I have seen it many, many times before on an exam. What, which of the following, it's like a multiple choice question. Which of the following lists the three parts of the brainstem in order from superior to inferior? Midbrain, pons, medulla oblongata. Midbrain, pons, medulla oblongata. Sometimes it's a short answer question. So make sure that you memorize those so you can so you can list them in a short answer question. Okay. Excuse me, a little sip of coffee, a little sip of go juice, and ready to go. Uh, basic functions of the four parts of the brain are listed down there. Cerebrum, thinking, consciousness, sensory, perception, motor movement. We're going to break that down as we go along. The diencephalon, hormonal control. It's it's really the diencephalon is sort of the center of your um, endocrine system. A lot of the endocrine system begins here, your hormonal control, smooth muscle control, body temperature regulation, it says, et cetera. In the book, we're going to talk about that, et cetera. All right, we're going we're gonna to get to that. Cerebellum, balance and equilibrium, and brainstem vital centers. Guys, what does the word vital mean? We've talked about this a little bit before. When you see that word vital, it doesn't mean the same thing that we sometimes mean in common every ordin everyday ordinary language, like vital. Oh, it's so vital. We, we say, oh, it's important. But the word vital actually comes from a Latin word, vita, which means what? Anybody want to take a guess? Just take a guess at what that means? Any guesses? Life. Did you Google it? You Googled it, you guys. That's fine. That's excellent. It is the Latin word. I, hey, you know, I don't know. I don't judge. Um, 
it is the Latin word that means life. So when we talk about vital, yeah, vida, vida, mm -hmm. yep, vida in Spanish. Mm -hmm. Trivia question. What country has as its national slogan, pura vida? No, you don't have to answer right now. I'm just going to leave it down there. It's lovely. I've been there a couple of times. I'd love to go back. One of these days, I'm going to move there. Um, <clears throat> so vita, vital. So when we talk about taking a patient's vital signs, we're talking about... <laughs> Did you Google that, Tonya? <laughs> but it's correct. Costa Rica. Costa Rica, beautiful country. Can't wait to go back someday. Um, so uh, the, when we talk about taking the patient's vital signs, um, uh, it's great. Isn't it great? So great. Um, can't wait to take my kids someday. Um, one of the things I love about Costa Rica is how much they love America, too. They actually, in Costa Rica, they celebrate our July 4th. On July 4th, they will have an American holiday in a similar way to this past week. A lot of people in America celebrated um, St. Patrick's Day. Uh, they do that in Costa Rica, too. So vital signs, Vita. So this is connected to this. This is how this is going to become important for us going forward. This brain stem consisting of midbrain, pons, and medulla controls things like heart rate blood pressure, respirations, okay? Now, again, body temperature is kind of more under the control of the diencephalon, but body temperature is your other vital sign. Those are your four major vital signs. And not just nurses, most folks going into healthcare need to know those. Uh, but those are where it says vital centers. I wanted to kind of make a big deal out of that word vital so you guys understand what we mean in clinical terminology, what we mean when we use the word um, vital, okay? All right, so the brain, as we get into it, the brain is actually covered and protected by these protective layers called meninges. So if we take a very, let's look at this image right up here first. There's the brain sitting in the skull. And you can see this is, of course, this is the frontal bone that we've learned about, the parietal bone here, occipital bone around the back. And of course, it wraps all the way around. You've got the temporal bones on the side, the sphenoid bone down here at the base. The brain is well protected all the way around by bone. Okay, so it's got bony protection. But if you take a look at this image zoomed in right up here, top center, this is the bone, so this is like parietal bone. And then just inside that, before you get to the actual cerebral cortex, which is the brain itself, the surface of the brain, before you get to that, you have multiple layers of tissue and fluid that surround and protect the brain. The outermost layer, uh, you can see this is capital letter A on page 154, is referred to as the dura mater, Okay, and, and which means the tough mother. Tough mother. I, I don't know why all three of these layers are called mother. Uh, the middle layer, sometimes we call it arachnoid for short, but you can see its full official name is arachnoid mater, and the internal is the pia mater. The dura. Notice I'm saying it the way that it would be pronounced in Latin, but not most people don't say it that way. They say dura mater, uh, but it, notice that it is not spelled with two T's, like, you know, the matter that the universe is made of, all matter is made of atoms, or as we will see when we get into the brain itself, it has layers of tissue called gray matter and white matter. That Those words are M-A-T-T-E-R. This is the Latin word for mother where we get the word maternal or maternity. Um, so that's that should be pretty familiar to you. And dura is like durable, durable. So dura mater means the tough mother. And it's the outermost layer, right? And there are places where that dura mater actually folds inward. It kind of creases inward and separates the left and right hemispheres of the brain 
that's referred to as the Falks Cerebri. That's the name for it right there. And this kind of whitish blue sheet that you see here is just growing down from that dura mater. It's kind of pulling down, it's growing downward from it. And the brain would be the, like the right side of the brain would be over there and the left side of the brain would be over here. This is kind of what it looks like all put together. But in reality, the two hemispheres have this falx cerebri, this sheet that kind of splits between the two, like a partial, partial dividing wall. It doesn't go all the way down. So the brain is able to connect its two sides together right down in here. But the, the hemispheres themselves are divided by this falx cerebri. All right. Now, that dura also has a little bit of a space. There's not usually much space to it, but it's called the subdural space just under the matter, uh, so under the dura matter. Um, you know, as it says in your lecture notes, the clinical significance is um, you could you could uh, get a blood vessel injury there and it could bleed into that space that's called a subdural hematoma. Um, just a quick side note on that for really everybody, if you're going into some career imaging, um, this, this could even affect the respiratory therapy folks, uh, definitely the nurses. Uh, one of the scariest things about a subdural hematoma is the pressure that it puts. One of the things that I already mentioned is how surrounded by bone the brain is see how the brain is completely surrounded by bone everywhere really except for that um uh, except for that big hole down here at the bottom called foramen magnum where the spinal cord goes through so um you know the brain is completely sur surrounded by bone which is great except when anything happens to increase the fluid pressure inside that skull so if you get a subdural hematoma um, if you get a concussion that increases the pressure inside the skull, the 